Tak dámy a páni, želám vám príjemné, dobré ráno. Ja myslím, že tá sála sa postupne naplní. Vonku máme trošku horšie počasie, ale o to veselšia nálada bude tu v tejto sále, zvlášť pri tej prezentácii zaujímavej, ktorú vám ponúkneme. Ja vás teda vítam aj na druhom dni tohto podujatia Slovakia Tech 2019 a verím, že bude rovnako zaujímavé pre vás, ako bol aj včerajší deň. Je to trojdňová konferencia, tak verím, že každý si nájde tú svoju tému. Je tu niekoľko stageov a niekoľko inovácií oproti tomu minulému roku. Tou prvou je určite dražba. Ak ste sa včera nestretli s dražbou, tak počas tejto konferencie dávame do pozornosti dražbu o jedno zaujímavé umelecké dielo, ktoré kreslí robotický umelec. Je to tá to rameno robotické, ktoré keď vchádzate do tejto miestnosti, je rovno pred vami. Je tam už časť toho diela nakresleného, je to Notre Dame a vyzerá to tak, že ešte nejakých pár hodín sa to kresliť bude. Rozhodne môžete mať toto dielo doma, ak sa zapojíte do dražby. Tá dražba, ja si pomôžem, výťažok z tej dražby bude venovaný katedre biomedicínskeho inžinierstva a merania na Strojnickej fakulte Technickej univerzity v Košiciach. Čiže zároveň podporíte aj dobrú vec, pretože samotná fakulta sa zaoberá tlačou 3D implantátov, ako tu aj včera zaznelo a sú to veci, ktoré aj Slovensko posúvajú vpred a pán podpredseda vlády, pán Raši včera rozprával o tom, že tu bol vytlačený jeden z najväčších implantátov do ľudského výsledku tela prostredníctvom tejto katedry. No, ja myslím, že môžeme prejsť na samotnú prvú prezentáciu, ako inak bude sa týkať technológií a samozrejme technológie tvoria ľudia. Ja sám behám za technológiami po celom svete, stretávam sa s ľuďmi, veľmi ma zaujíma, ako prišiel im do hlavy ten nápad, ako niečo stvorili a myslím si, že rovnaké poslanie má aj náš dnešný prezentátor, mimochodom je to tiež technologický novinár, ktorý sa týmito témami zaoberá a veľmi veľa cestuje, dokonca ešte viac ako ja po tom svete. Čiže v tejto chvíli ja by som rád odovzdal slovo pánovi Davidovi Rovenovi, ktorý je šéf-redaktorom magazínu Wired a vy môžete tohto pána spovedať prostredníctvom slajdu. Samozrejme, otázky poprosíme v angličtine, alebo potom mu to budeme skúšať nejakým spôsobom preložiť. Môžete sa po anglicky pýtať po jeho prezentácii. Rozhodne bude, o čom aj táto prezentácia bude veľmi zaujímavá. Takže v tejto chvíli už odozdávam slovo Davidovi. Hello. Do you mind if I speak English? I'll speak not too quickly. Um, thank you for being here this early morning. Um, so I'm a journalist who's um, set up a magazine in the UK called Wired about 10 years ago. Um, and I got to know a lot of entrepreneurs and got to be obsessed with how the good ones are thinking. And then I saw a lot of corporates that are trying to be more like the startups and are mostly failing. So I became fascinated by what the really impressive corporates could learn from the startups. Um, and there's a rude word in the title because um, a lot of the time they're trying things which are never going to work. So I will explain a little about what I have learned um, on a journey across 20 countries. But I guess the context is machine learning, quantum computing, data analytics, bioinformatics. All these trends are moving at such a fast exponential scale that whatever successful business you have today, you can't relax because the reality that you're working in is changing in real time. If you think about um, every week there's some new artificial intelligence computer vision project. Um, this is a few scientists in Moscow 
in Skolkovo who recently found a way to take any two-dimensional image and animate it as if it was a video. Um, they use a deep learning algorithm. And so suddenly you can see if Mona Lisa was on Instagram, what she would look like. And this is kind of, this was impossible just a few months ago. And now there is no difference between a two-dimensional and a three-dimensional image. Um, think of how we can now fake video without very much effort so we can have people appearing to say things that they're not actually saying. So see if um, you think President Obama said this about President Trump. How about this? Simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Maybe now, he did. You see, I would never say these things. This is, again, another team that have found a way to make it appear somebody's saying something that they're not. And, you know, this is going to affect all sorts of things, not least politics. We now have startups because artificial intelligence is becoming a little like electricity. It's becoming a commodity that, at very low cost, are able to use this. There's a startup in um, London called Synthesia that's able to get you to appear to speak in multiple languages. It's great if you're doing customer service. Um, we have a great footballer called David Beckham, who's famous for what he does on the football pitch, but he's not so famous for having kind of intellectual powers. Um, I'll show you David Beckham speaking in multiple languages. Malaria isn't just any disease. It's the deadliest disease there's ever been. Se dice que ha matado más de la mitad de la población que ha existido. Billion million tan murit kwe. Wa ma zala taqtul tiflan kull daqiqatayn. Ne lo pouvons imet. So if you add to this what's happening in autonomous driving in large scale real time data analytics you can't rest. So um through Wired magazine we um tracked the entrepreneurs building the future, but also the scientific research projects, the designs that are going to go mainstream, and also the um, business models and customer behavior. And all of these things combine in an accelerated way. But it means um, I'm doing a talk next week to the airline industry. And as well as cultural change, like um, Greta encouraging people to be ashamed of flying. There's also technological change. There are now startups like Lilium in Germany that are making the personal vertical takeoff electric jet. This is a startup with quite a lot of funding, and now it's doing something which is just one of dozens of startups trying to reinvent flight using technology tools. Or what about the way we transport things over long distances. So this is a very well-funded startup called Zipline that's using drones to deliver blood and medical supplies in places like Rwanda, where it saves a lot of time instead of going through the very poor roads. And we're connecting the world in a kind of digital way as um, we're taking um, emerging technologies using sensor information using computer vision, using data from satellites. So there are a bunch of companies now, including this one called Planet, that are using nanosatellites this big, putting thousands of them in orbit, so they get real-time imaging of this planet. And they sell subscription services. So Planet um, was monitoring the building um, that Apple was putting up in Cupertino. Apple, very secretive, didn't want media there. But of course, you can't stop the satellites constantly providing a feed of what's happening. So we have new layers of information coming from shipping, coming from infrastructure, about weather that five years ago um, we didn't have. And of course, if you are in media, if you're in manufacturing, if you're in retailing, this changes the norm. So you have to innovate. You have to change your idea of what it is that you're selling. Three years ago, Amazon showed this um, concept store they'd built in Seattle that doesn't have a cash desk. You 
click in with your phone and then it tracks you through the store so you can take things from the shelves and put them in your bag and then just walk out. It uses um, proximity sensors, computer vision, algorithms processing this, and it's trying to get rid of the friction. It doesn't want anybody to have to wait to pay. And at the time, lots of other retailers kind of dismissed this as showing off, as a gimmick, as not that important. And then last year, Amazon says, we're about to open 3,000 of these stores across the United States. And then every retailer who's not offering a friction-free experience, who's not allowing people just to take something and walk out, well, they're looking behind the curve. What's happening with the way we communicate with businesses? So, you know, in the last couple of years, we've started to get excited about chatbots, very simple AI that allows you to ask a question. But what about the next stage when the customer's expectation will be a personalized response in a kind of human form in real time, in whatever language they want to speak? Um, so we're starting to see startups experimenting. This is a startup in New Zealand called Soul Machines that makes computer-generated faces. These are not videos of people, these are CGI. The guy behind the company uh, used to work in Hollywood. They yes. speak back to you. There's a no. camera, there's a microphone, no. and they respond to no. your signals. And they do it in Goodbye. multiple languages. Welcome in Deutschland. So you talk to the screen, you speak, it sees your facial expressions, it interprets them, the CGI Hi, listens to the you? words, watches your expression, and then responds. And they're starting to use this, um, some governments like Australia, for interactions um, between government and the public, between healthcare and the patient. But we're just at that very early stage, and it's becoming um, harder to keep up. So the answer everybody has in mind is, well, let's just become more innovative. Let's innovate. Let's appoint a director of innovation, or let's give them a really cool job title, like chief disruptive growth officer, or digital Sherpa. And let's have a separate building called our innovation unit, or our startup accelerator. And the problem is, that often doesn't make any difference to the core business. The core business stays doing what it was doing, stays thinking in the way it was thinking. And that's quite high risk. But we in the media encourage this idea that innovation is some shiny gimmick. Every year, there is the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, which is the world's biggest tech conference, I think 130,000 people. And we celebrate these amazing innovations in tech. And sometimes I look a bit more closely at things that the media are celebrating, and I think, does the world need these innovations? This was last year, a great innovation. Um, this year, the innovations at the Consumer Electronics Show included the way to tell your social network each time you were having a new beer. <laughs> I don't think I needed that. The um, connected cat tray, so you got notifications every time your cat did what cats often do. The problem is this is not really thinking through why people need these new products, why it's worth putting money into fake innovation. Um, and yet, quite a lot of money does go into fake innovation. I don't know if you remember um, a couple of years ago, a company called Juiceru made the world's best juicing machine. It cost about $700 initially. Um, it was internet connected, had sensors, had Bluetooth. And the idea was you'd have to buy these expensive sachets which you put in the machine and it squeezed them in a perfect way and made you the best smoothie in the morning. Um, and that was fine. It raised, I think, $120 million, including Google Ventures, some big VCs. And then some journalists um, from Bloomberg took the sachets, realized they could squeeze them in their hand and get just as good juices. Um, they wrote about this. Um, the company then goes bust, having burned through $120 million. This is not a real 
innovation. Nobody needs it. Um, this company went through $180 million with its not very real innovation. Um, it was called Quirky, and it took ideas from the crowd and then manufactured hardware and then sold it on Kickstarter and elsewhere, and you got a little bit of a reward. Um, one of the products, Quirky, which raised $180 million um, put on the market was the smart milk jug. So if you're the sort of person who worries about how fresh your milk is when you're on a business trip, um, this will send you an urgent notification. So maybe you cancel that flight, you go back home and rescue your milk. Um, they went bust, but not before they had issued the $50 smart egg container. Um, and you know, I don't know if you're like me, I don't really care about my eggs at home, but this one sends you push notifications to know when you're running low and when your eggs are less fresh. Every day I'm seeing new innovations that the world maybe doesn't need. You know, I see a lot of drones. I saw this one called Pro Drone, which claims to be the first drone with robot arms. And I'm thinking, is this now meant to be the way you take your children to school? Or there's always a dark side to tech. Maybe this is the way to abduct children from school. And sometimes I can't tell the difference between a real innovation product and like a marketing trick. So I saw um, this last year, which was the way for people who can't get away from Instagram to have their lunch, the spoon. And I'm thinking, is this real? Is this real? It was getting a lot of love on social media, and then I kind of traced it, and it was actually a marketing agency that put it out, so maybe it's not real. But this definitely was real, because it had um, 915 people pay for it on Kickstarter. Um, this is an innovation for people who get annoyed by their iPhone. The No Phone does all the things that you wish your iPhone does. The battery doesn't run out, the screen doesn't get smashed, you never have to pay extra for data. In fact, it's a block of granite. Um, but they still raised $18,000. Um, it's usually the Chinese, though, who are the most innovative. Um, I don't know if you have one of those health insurance policies where they give you a discount if you share your movement data. Uh, well, they've solved this with a really good innovation in China. So why am I telling you all this? Because um, there is an acceleration happening, which means you can't kind of relax. So the Moore's Law curve is hitting all sorts of other industries. It's hitting the falling cost of battery storage. It's changing the energy market on one of those exponential curves. So um, a thousand dollar battery at the start of this century is forecast by um, Bloomberg to drop to $73 by the end of um, the next decade. If you're making an internal combustion engine car, well, soon the economics will make absolutely no sense. The same is happening in the falling cost of solar energy. The same is happening in, a f in the falling cost of sequencing human DNA. Um, this is a logarithmic scale, so the green curve is actually falling more quickly than Moore's law. So something that at the start of the century was $100 million is now $50. Um, and this changes all sorts of things, such as healthcare. And of course, these exponential curves change customer behavior. Very interesting little trends. I'll show you a very, very steep curve now. This is how couples met. If you see that red curve from the 1980s, that's couples who met online. And look at some of the declining curves. The blue is couples who met through introductions from friends. The brown, couples who met in school. The black, couples who met through family. So, you know, these are real trends. And I guess if you think about how much people are obsessively online the whole time, every company that's not digital first, even if you're manufacturing fertilizer, even if you're making saucepans, you have to be there. Mary Meeker 
Um, an internet analyst and investor produces an annual report on internet trends. And um, this is from her latest. It's the amount of hours American adults are spending on their digital devices every day. The green is the mobile. The blue at the bottom is kind of all sorts of other things. This is the laptop and desktop. And this is over the last 10 years, from 2008. It's gone from 2.7 hours a day to last year, 6.3 hours a day, so almost three times as much. And this is time that we're not spending talking to our children, to our colleagues at work. This is time we are on the screen. And so you can't stop these curves. You have to respond. And it means you know, if you're in fashion, if you're in cosmetics, you have new competition that doesn't have the same sunk costs that your business has. You know, this is among the world's youngest billionaires. She has a cosmetics business. But if you look at the detail, Kylie Cosmetics started less than four years ago. Seven full-time employees. She outsources the manufacturing to a company called Seed Beauty. She outsources sales and delivery to a merchant called Shopify. Her mum does finance and PR. Her marketing is her online. So if you are Chanel, if you are Estee Lauder, it doesn't matter if you have 100 years of tradition, if you have thousands of employees in expensive buildings. This is now your competition. If you're a burger company like McDonald's, you have to be an AI burger company, which is why McDonald's keeps buying data analytics companies um, like this Israeli company for $300 million, because it realized to be competitive, it needs to understand customer demand as things like traffic and weather change and try and preempt that demand. This is um, the homepage of a bank, HSBC, that has been annotated by CB Insights, so that every link on the home page now links to some of the startups trying to eat the lunch of that big bank. So everything from currency exchange to insurance to borrowing to investing. And if you are the bank, you can't rest, you can't relax. You have to do what the startup is doing, otherwise soon you'll be irrelevant. And this is one sector, I can show you a similar home page with annotations for media, for delivery, for logistics, for medicine. So what do you do? How do you respond if you are part of a big successful organization that was doing very well yesterday? How do you stay relevant tomorrow? So obviously, you have to adapt to the startup speed of execution, the feedback loop where the startup monitors changing customer demand and moves into another direction. And a lot of companies are starting to try and put startups in a physical place together. So this is a yogurt company called Chobani that has a food incubator. Even a company making airline aeroplanes has um, a startup accelerator. But so often, this is removed from the actual decision making in the company. It's like, let's tick a box. And it's theater. It's going through the motions, trying to look to your shareholders, to the media, like you're innovating. But it's not changing anything. And it often makes me think when I see one of these big successful companies that are talking about innovation, but staying doing what they were doing. Do you remember when Wiley Coyote is chased off the cliff by a roadrunner? He keeps running and only later realizes he hasn't been on solid ground for a while. And of course, gravity is going to take you. So I decided to look around to see if any existing successful organization was doing real innovation. And um, I went to 20 countries and in ended up writing a book identifying what works, what approaches 
leaders are taking that deliver future-facing value. And when I was starting to research the book, I saw that there was an international organization that claimed to be the organization for real innovators. And it's called the International Association of Innovation Professionals. And you can go online and you can buy a certification saying you're a true innovator and you can subscribe to their webinars. And this looked a bit suspicious to me. And then I saw last year, they were having their annual convention in Washington DC called InnovateCon. And they were claiming to bring all the innovators together to teach you. So I went along, I got a cheap flight to Washington and I kind of sniffed around and I realized there is a lot of corporate money heading towards consultants because every corporate is a little scared. And the head of the International Association of Innovation Professionals pulls me aside during the cocktail reception and said, David, we have the scientific formula for innovation. I said, a scientific formula? Isn't innovation kind of messy and human and organic? And he said, no, 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 it's a repeatable scientific formula. And he drew on a cocktail napkin three circles. There's always three circles. One was hard science, one was social science, and one was business. And he looked at the shaded bit in the middle and he said, that is the scientific basis of innovation, which I didn't entirely buy. So I went looking, and I went to um, Peru, I went to China, I went to Estonia. And I'll share quickly things I learned that really do empower organizations to change and to build future facing value, to make them more likely not just to survive, but to make profits as technology is changing, as consumer behavior is transforming. Um, so I'll give you 10 quick lessons I learned. First of all, it's no longer about the boss making decisions. Hierarchy doesn't work anymore. You need to empower everybody in the organization to be the head of innovation because they are the people who are monitoring changing customer needs. They are the people who have ideas and you need to find a way to use your talent to help the company stay relevant. This is the games company um, in Helsinki in Finland that makes games you probably play. Um, and the founder, Ilka Pananen of Supercell, um, he always says he wants to be the world's least powerful CEO. He wants to appoint good people, create the conditions where they can decide how they work, where they can learn from each other, where they can feel autonomous. And it's made Supercell the most successful games company in Europe. And it's called Supercell because it's a collection of cells, small teams, maybe 13 to 18 people, that decide how they work. Um, I went to see them in Helsinki. And I met one guy, Jonathan Downey, who had been leading a team of 10 people for a whole year working on a game. And these are very expensive salaries. And they tested the game on the Canadian app store. It wasn't getting great engagement, so they kind of modified it. They kept going back. And after a while, they were getting frustrated. So he calls the team together. This is Finland. So they go for a sauna, a team sauna. And in the sauna, they decide they weren't excited enough to continue but they were all wanting to make new games. So he gets back to the office, types an email to the whole company saying, we're killing this project, sorry for everybody who's worked on it, um, and we're gonna find new things to do. And he didn't ask the boss, but the boss would have liked it that way because that's how you get people motivated, because it's a battle now for talent. There's a hotel in London called Claridge's. It's five star, six star hotel, two or 3,000 euros a night to stay there. And for 10 years, they needed more space. They wanted to build a basement. They couldn't build up. They couldn't buy the neighboring buildings. And for 10 years, they said to builders, to construction firms, to consulting engineering firms, um, we want five stories of basement, but we have two rules. We don't want to close the hotel for the building and the second rule is the only way the builders can get anything in and out of the hotel is one single window, two meters by two meters at the back. Um, and for 10 years, everybody said, you can't do this while keeping the hotel open. This is the impossible basement project. Until 
they invited some consulting engineers from a company that's owned by the staff called Arup. It's um, based in London, 15,000 employees around the world. They build the toughest projects, the channel tunnel link, the Chinese CCTV headquarters, bridges, skyscrapers. And it's owned by the staff, and the staff decide how they work. And the team at Arup went to see Claridge's, and they thought, this is a really interesting intellectual challenge. Can we think together and get excited about it? And they found a way to solve it. They brought in a bunch of miners from Ireland who they got to dig by hand 30 meter deep trenches, 62 of these. They took the mud out of the window at the back. And when they dug the 62 trenches, they filled them with concrete. And then they suspended the whole hotel on top of them. And then they dug the basements. So the people upstairs didn't know because the hotel was supported. And they finished it in February. And they now have five very, very elegant basements because nobody was telling these people how to work. So the second thing I noticed is in a business where what you're doing is being commodified, don't think of what you're selling as a product. Think of it as a service. This is a bookshop quite near Claridge's in Mayfair in London that's been there since the 1930s. And it's been losing money for a while. You can't compete with Amazon. It was struggling. It has to pay rent. Haywood Hill Books had a new boss came in. And he thought, we can never win as experts in selling books. But what if we rethink our value as experts in curating collections of books? What if we become the human algorithm? Will people pay more? And so they started working with some of their more demanding customers to customize libraries. And the first customer was a wealthy lady in Switzerland who wanted 3,000 books on modernist art for her mountain chalet. And they charged her about 600,000 euros. So they're now doing that, making quite a lot of profit. And then they thought, what about people we get to know who walk in off the street? Why don't we find a way to recommend a book for them each month? So they have five or six ladies sitting in the basement reading a couple of hundred books every year. And if you decide to subscribe to this service, and it's 500 euros, 600 euros, 700 euros, each month they will choose a book for you. They'll have it gift wrapped. They'll have it sent to you. You get 12 a year. It's very profitable. They've now got a few thousand people subscribing to this service. So now the, the company is profitable, it's resilient, and it's competing because it's selling a service. The bank in Finland, the biggest consumer bank, a 100-year-old bank, it's called Oppa, they realize that they're not going to compete with all the startups. How do you stay relevant as a big consumer bank? And they thought about it. And they thought, well, the products we're offering, the startups can offer as well, probably more intuitively designed. What is our service? Well, we've always helped our customers through the difficult bits of their life, buying a house, getting a job. Why don't we help them with service offerings that the startups can't easily do, staying healthy? The bank now has five private hospitals it's built and runs inside Finland. And because it's a bank, They've come in getting experts to help them. If you were designing the perfect hospital today, how would you start? And it's very efficient. If you break your leg, you can have a scan that afternoon. If you need surgery, they have capacity to do it the next morning. They also now have a health insurance product, which, because the hospital is so efficient, is lower cost than others in Finland. So the bank is thriving by offering non-bank services. 10% of the profits of the bank have in the past come from helping people buy cars and insure cars. They think that's going to go when we don't buy cars, we use the autonomous car network. 
how do we stay relevant? So the bank now has a new team offering what they call mobility as a service. Is there another way people will pay for cars? So they have an app that allows you to rent a car by the minute. It's thinking what is the service, not the product. Real innovators understand that they are not isolated. They partner effectively with other organizations where there's mutual benefit. It's an ecosystem approach. Um, and my favorite example was them, this gentleman in Beijing, he's called Lei Jun. He set up a company called Xiaomi that makes really high quality smartphones. Um, he's often accused of stealing from Apple. And he once made the mistake of wearing the black turtleneck and at a presentation using the phrase, one more thing. Um, the media didn't like that. I won't comment on what the design of the Xiaomi stores look like. But he's actually very original because their business model is about an ecosystem. So Xiaomi makes no profit on the phones because it's such a competitive market in China. Instead, their 300 million customers, they try and sell accessories, hardware products, services. And they don't make the accessories. They just invest a small amount in hundreds of hardware companies. And then they brand their products. They give the hardware company access to their supply chain, space in the stores, access to their customers. The best-selling air purifier in China is Xiaomi. The best-selling battery pack in China is Xiaomi. Not made by Xiaomi, but they get a lot of the profit, which has made them a very successful company. And I went to ask the guy running the investment team, and these are not finance people, these are hardware engineers. Um, you're a manufacturing company, why don't you make these accessories yourself? And he said, well, first of all, we'd have to double our headcount. We'd have so many staff, we'd never get decisions made. And secondly, these guys have to survive on the streets every day knowing what today's customer wants, not what yesterday's customer wants. We would rather put the risk in their hands so we can do what we're good at. We put him on the cover of Wired, actually, saying it's time to copy China. Um, and it's not just companies that build ecosystems. It's governments that can as well. So in Estonia, small country of 1.3 million people, um, only independent from the Soviet Union in 1991. Very early, because they had no money to buy big computers, they used the internet, and every citizen had a digital identity card. Um, they even back up everything that the government does in Luxembourg, just in case the Russians come back in and shut everything down. Um, they thought, how do we stay competitive when we're a tiny country in an increasingly global market? Why don't we let people who are not physically in Estonia be part of Estonia? Um, so I went to see this gentleman, Kaspar Korgis, who built a system called e-residency that allows anybody in Slovakia, in India, in the UK, to go online, to spend 15 minutes filling in a form, and then in a couple of weeks, you go to your local Estonian embassy and you pick up your digital identity card, which allows you to set up a company in Estonia, to trade from Estonia, to have your accounts dealt with in Estonia, and you don't ever have to go there. It's called e-residency, and Kaspar talks about government as an app store. He wants other governments to start to offer services to that e-resident community. He wants it to be, as he calls it, a platform. And it's a very interesting way of rethinking what a nation state is without having physical borders. So every company obviously needs to serve customer needs. But what if you can find a way to serve needs that nobody is meeting? That leads to real innovation. Um, let me take you to Peru to meet this entrepreneur called Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, who runs, um, I think, the biggest conglomerate in Peru called Intercorp that has banks, supermarkets, pharmacies, hotels, cinemas. It's 4% of the GDP of Peru. It's 80,000 employees, it's $8 billion turnover. And I don't know if you've been to Peru, but it's had a troubled few years. 
I think of the last five presidents, those that are not in jail or waiting to go to jail have commil committed suicide because they're in trouble. It's been very corrupt. It had decades of civil war and hyperinflation. They've had 15 education ministers in 15 years, and it's kind of broken. And Carlos was concerned that because education is so poor, they were not getting talent to come and work for his company, but also the customers were not becoming wealthier, so they were not aspiring to spend more money. And he thought, this is a real need that nobody is solving. The school system is poor. We're going to have to set up a school system. But we're entrepreneurs, so it has to be for profit. But it has also to meet the real needs of the people in the emerging middle class. So they put a team of people in a house in the lower middle class neighborhood of uh, La Victoria, which is quite dangerous at night. And they're living among the people they're trying to help. They partnered with um, the design agency IDEO. They went to look at the best educationists in the world. They went to Berkeley, to Harvard, to Oxford. And they thought, if we design a school system from scratch, what would it be for age three to 18? First of all, you would have kids using tablets. You'd have them in small groups. You'd have online plus offline education. And they built the school system. It's called Innova Schools. They now have 55 schools in Peru. They're starting to export them to Panama, to Mexico. They're about $125 a month, which is just affordable for the lower middle class families, but it still gives them a tiny profit, so it makes it sustainable. And they're getting twice the results in the national attainment tests as the other schools. And this is proper innovation because it's solving a real need, it's helping the business, and it's making Intercourt, the business, attract talent from everywhere else, because it has a purpose. And they define the purpose on their home page now. We're not a bank company, we're not a supermarket company. We are trying to make Peru the best place in Latin America to bring up a family. After schools, they're solving healthcare. They're building a national network of low-cost, high-quality health clinics. They're also now working on how you bring internet connectivity to the villages. And this is a private company. How in your team do you allow these innovations to come through? So you have a diverse group of people thinking. Bring different types of people together, like they do at Google X, the moonshot research lab of Alphabet. And you may come up with things like the self-driving car business, Waymo, or the um, balloons that fly at the stratosphere that send internet connectivity out. It's called Loon. Or there's a business that makes delivery drones. Each of these has been spun off into a business, some of them very, very valuable businesses. And one of the secrets of X is they bring different types of people together, not just engineers, not just tech people, but um, the product designer with the former sports person, the coder with the origami paper folding expert. And cognitive diversity leads to fresh ways to solve problems. Kathy Hannon was working there in marketing, and she had an obsession with carbon neutral fuel. And she thought, could you take seawater and take the hydrogen and the carbon from the seawater and combine them to make a new kind of fuel? So she went to the bosses. They don't knock you down. They don't laugh at your stupid idea. It's called psychological safety. They want you to feel bold to come up with an idea. And they said, OK, we'll give you a little bit of money. And if you get some key metrics, then we'll give you a bit more money. At the very beginning of the process, they also want you to commit to something they call a kill metric. If you don't reach this metric, we will kill the project straight away. She starts working on it. She gets a team together. She proves the science. She comes up with the fuel. It's very expensive. Her kill metric was it has to be no more expensive than gas at the gas station. At the beginning, it's $1,000 per gallon then $100 per gallon, then 50. She works on this for two years with her team. The team gets bigger. They get more funding. 
They get it down to about 10 or $15 a gallon, and then she goes to the boss and says, we need to kill this. It's going to take longer to get to 4 or $5 a gallon, and it's going to cost more, and I promised that was my metric. And they all get a cash bonus for killing their little baby. And I think the culture of X has come up with some mistakes as a consumer product. This was a mistake, but this is a business that's going to be worth $100 billion. Can you allow different types of ideas? So one of the things that startups can do, the really good startups, is small teams move quickly, solve problems, change direction if they can't solve the problem. What about if you're a big three million person organization? The American Department of Defense, which has the world's biggest office building, they had a problem. All the procurement projects seem to be coming in over budget, late, and they're not what the soldiers on the ground need. ISIS is a startup. ISIS can take a commercial DJI drone, put a grenade on it, send it over the border in Iraq, and kill people. The American Defense Department spends two years trying to come up with a way of solving this. It doesn't work. The Defense Department realized they needed a bit of startup inside this big bureaucracy. So they hired a guy from startups called Chris Lynch, who swears a lot. He wears hoodies that say things like, hack the Pentagon, and he doesn't care who hates him. And he has a team of 30 people, mostly from startups, in a room inside the Pentagon, and their job is to solve problems that the bureaucracy can't solve. And they choose what they work on. They call themselves the Rebel Alliance because they don't give a damn. In fact, this is on their door. It's officially called Defense Digital Service, but it says Rebel Alliance. They wanted to test the security of public-facing American defense websites. So they wanted a bug bounty competition where you give cash rewards to friendly hackers. Everybody said it was impossible, it was illegal, you can't do it. They found a legal way to do it. Within the first 10 minutes, people had found vulnerabilities. It's now mandatory across American government to have bug bounty competitions. They went to the front line in a Middle Eastern country where ISIS were putting the drones over the borders. And with the soldiers on the ground in a couple of weeks, they created a radio signal jammer that took down those drones and saved lives. And grudgingly, they earned respect of the people in uniform. And the Secretary of Defense starts putting them in, on the stage with him because they were the pirates empowered to come into the organization and ignore the rules to solve the problems. So we all know about the power of data. How can innovation take the data you have and find new ways to use it? The airline industry is a very analog industry. This company has been around for 100 years, and it's a horrible business, aviation. You don't control your cost, which is mostly fuel. You're competing against the low-cost carriers, plus the internet takes a lot of your commission. At Qantas, where they'd been losing billions of dollars for a few years, the new boss, um, Alan Joyce, earlier this decade, realized they had an asset that could protect them, which was a really successful loyalty program, which half of the population of Australia is in. And people love sharing data, because the Australian loyalty program, you don't just spend on airplanes you can spend it on your supermarket. You can earn points when you go to the bar, when you have your shoes repaired. And so people love getting the personalized offers, so they're sharing their data. And they realize, why don't we create a separate unit inside Qantas, building businesses on the data from the loyalty program? So next to headquarters behind Sydney Airport, they have a building with 150 people, not from aviation. They have DevOps people, agile startup people, designers, ethnographers, and they've built so far a health insurance business, a life insurance business, a food and drink club, a golf club, credit card businesses. This year, or the last year I saw, um, it was about 30% of the profit 
of the whole airline. So they're using aviation, they're using the loyalty of the, the data from the loyalty scheme to protect the core business and to make it much more resilient. So you can take any kind of business and create new value out of data. In China, how do you know what consumers are buying in real time? So there's a project from the Chinese post office funded by um, the richest man in Hong Kong, Li Kaixing. They're putting point of sale devices in the villages of China, in village stores, so they can see what village customers across China are buying. They're doing a million village stores, places like this where I visited. And it's amazing. You get the data, you can search it through your mobile, and if you are a beer company, you can see it's very hot this Tuesday in September in this region. How many beer crates should we deliver for tomorrow? It's more than I've ever seen in the West, consumer data in real time. And, and I guess every kind of business is turning into a data analytics business to survive. Um, there's a Swiss company that's more than 100 years old called ABB that makes industrial robots like this or the big transformers in the electric power station. They're starting to put sensors in all their machines so they can collect data from their customers and sell it back to them so they know when to service the machines, how to optimize production. Because um, everything is data. There's even a startup in San Francisco that's reverse engineering the molecular structure of fine wine and whiskey and making those wines without using grapes. Um, they analyze in the lab the smell, the taste, the bouquet. These are the guys. Um, it's called Endless West. And if you say this to French people, they get very upset. But the wine it kind of doesn't taste bad. A couple more things. Have a team in your organization looking for things you don't think you're looking for. Autodesk became a very successful software company 30 years ago when it made the design software AutoCAD that product designers, the architects, use. But what happens now when everything is not a disk of software, everything is in the cloud? Artificial intelligence affects how people design things. Autodesk spends a large proportion of its budget experimenting, playing, looking for things it doesn't think it's looking for. They have a pier in San Francisco on the water full of robots, 3D printers, artists they're paying to sit and work there on fellowships. And they use the pier to start prototyping new ways people can design. They monitor how people are changing their behavior. They think, how can the robots be used in Hollywood if we adapt new software? About three years ago, through their experimenting, they came up with something they called generative design, which is if you have a human working on something, designing something, and they gave the machine constraints, I want to design an airplane seat that's no more than this heavy, that's made with these materials. What if the artificial intelligence worked with them and suggested thousands of possibilities as they're changing their designs? Could that help them be more efficient? They weren't looking for it, they were just playing. And they realized this is going to be their next billion dollar product line. And then last year they started releasing products with generative design and they're hugely successful. So the AI generates alongside you, takes away a lot of the work, but still respects you as the human. And they weren't looking for it. Design a space where people work that brings different kinds of people together, because innovation comes when random ideas come and knock on each other, serendipity. Um, this is the Crick Institute in central London that's a new building that is the biggest biomedical research center in Europe, and it's trying to solve cancer and genomic illness. But of course, we're now in the, way, in the, in the era where it's no longer going to be a closed lab that solves cancer. It's going to be people from different specialities, the data analytics expert meeting the genomics expert, meeting the information designer. And so they've designed the Crick Institute with no walls on the inside. So there are lots of places where people come together, collaboration 
And that, I think, is how we're more likely to solve cancer, getting different expertise come together. Can you think of a way of designing an office so that people are not in their individual units, but they come together? Because a lot of the American entrepreneurs in San Francisco go to Burning Man every year, which is a temporary city of 70,000 people every August in the desert, in Nevada. And it's a kind of experimental, let's get different types of people together and see how creative we can be. This is why workplaces where people come together, different kind of businesses, one of the values they're selling is access to people who think in different ways. And finally, um, I guess this is obvious, don't ignore these emerging technologies. Think how they can be useful to create innovation, real innovation. This is a converted barn in a wine area of Northern California in Napa Valley. Um, and it's occupied by a bunch of Michelin-starred chefs who spend every day in this barn making recipes and filming them and putting the results in the app. And they work for a very big manufacturer of saucepans based in Hong Kong called Maya that is one of the world's top five manufacturers of aluminium pots. Why would this Hong Kong company that's 50 years old be employing Michelin-starred chefs to make recipes for an app? Um, Stanley Cheng, the billionaire who founded the company, was told by his son, who's in his 30s, Dad, the internet is coming for the kitchen. Stanley says, what do you mean? Vincent, the son, says, connected cooking, Dad, this is the new thing. People will want recipes feeding directly into their cookware. So the dad says to Vincent, try something, experiment. So Vincent sets up a company inside Maya, making a new kind of saucepan which connects to the internet. It has a sensor in the middle of the metal. It talks to a conductive heater that talks to the app so that when the app has a recipe, it tells you how hot it should be for how many seconds, the saucepan responds. And they now think they can sell a subscription service, you'll subscribe like Netflix, to recipes that will make you at home as good as a Michelin-starred chef. And it's very bold, but this saucepan company is experimenting with where behavior is going. And I said to Stanley, how big is this gonna be? He said, well, it's either gonna be a billion dollar business or zero, but if we don't experiment, we're gonna be zero, so we have to. Again, the tech is there. There's a fertilizer company in Norway, one of the world's biggest fertilizer companies that had problems getting the fertilizer from the company factory to the ports. So it decided to spend $40 million building the world's first autonomous electric cargo ship. The company's called Yara. The Yara Berkeland cargo ship is being built at the moment. And when they had a prototype um, revealed to the press two years ago, suddenly lots of other companies in Norway say, hey, can we pay you to use your autonomous electric cargo boat? Because our customers want sustainability. This is an effective way of solving that problem. They realize they have potentially a very valuable new business. So, things are gonna go wrong. What happens when things go wrong? That is also an opportunity to innovate, solving a real problem that the company has. There's a cotton textile manufacturer in India that I wrote about in the book, in Mumbai, that is making one in five towels and sheets sold in America. It's one of the world's biggest cotton textile companies. It's called Wellspun. And they had a problem. A um, couple of years ago, an American retailer called Target puts out a press statement that says, the 100% Egyptian cotton that's made for us by Wellspun, we've checked it's not Egyptian cotton. It's fake. We're going to refund everybody. We're never going to work with this company again. Wellspun, the shares collapse. It almost goes out of business. They think our only way of solving this, of surviving, is not just refunding the money, but becoming the most transparent company in the whole cotton supply chain. So they start using tech to track cotton from the field with RFID scans. When you get your final towel now, some of them have an RFID or a QR code. 
you can scan that as a customer it shows you exactly where your cotton has been, so you have transparency. In fact, they're solving this problem has meant that they now have the best way of tracking authentic supply chains in the whole industry. Other companies are now coming to them to pay them to use it. So I will leave you with the certainty that tech is coming for your business, um, and it's all about how you respond. And most of us, we kind of, we deny it at first. That first time you are in the completely autonomous car, you're going to think, this is not right. A guy called Bill Rimmer put his mother in his Tesla, switched it to autonomous, and filmed her reaction. It's scary. Oh, there's cars coming. Oh, oh, there's cars. Oh. Bill, just put me back for me control it. Oh, but you know, like Jesus. in two weeks, it will just be another way of going to the supermarket for her. Um, so I'm going to leave you with a question somebody asked on Reddit a couple of years ago. If somebody from the 1950s suddenly came back today, what would be the hardest thing to explain to them about modern life? And my favorite answer was, um, I have a device in my pocket that's capable of accessing the entirety of information known to man. And I use it to look at pictures of cats and to get into arguments with strangers. So we're very irrational. We're only human, but innovation is there for the taking. Thank you. Thank you very much. Takže je tu teda priestor na otázky. Ah, we got the first question. In English. I like English. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we don't have many exports. Our economy is in the toilet. Our politicians have closed our parliament. The last thing we have is English. Yeah, but it's not really functioning. <laughs> so who was the most inspirational person you met uh, as a journalist on your journeys around the world? It's a good question. Um, I mean, I meet lots of people who are quite famous and quite flawed when you dig in. Um, so, you know, it's always fun talking to some people like um, Elon Musk and um, Eric Schmidt and people like that. Um, but the more kind of you get close, you realize they're quite complex people. And um, Elon is, is le let's say, a tarnished hero. He's very good at telling stories. As an entrepreneur, storytelling is so important because you have to persuade not just the press and the investors, but your internal team. You believe in something. Um, and that's his gift. But I'm um, much more excited by the less known entrepreneurs who are trying to solve um, a real problem. And I think one of the most important areas of tech at the moment is health tech, because um, suddenly the human body is being analyzed as a source of data. And we're able to um, predict illness, to treat it in new ways. There are new areas involving um, genomics, involving things called digital therapeutics. Um, so tomorrow, I've decided to take 50 health tech people to Iceland for a weekend where they get to know each other. Um, and that's because a lot of the people there are building extraordinary businesses that are very, very difficult to build. Um, and the people who inspire me there are the people who are... And um, there's a guy in Australia called um, Mark Kendall, who's a professor. And he's building a business that allows you to put patches on your skin that go slightly below the surface. You don't feel it. And it can monitor, first of all, if you're likely to have a heart attack soon. Secondly, what's your blood sugar level? How dehydrated you are? These sorts of new approaches to reading data, I think they're the people who inspire me. Yeah, it's difficult to obtain a contact for these uh, people or um, to take a few minutes with Elon Musk. It's impossible for me. Um, you can try becoming his wife briefly. They don't tend to last very long. OK, okay a simple question. What about Brexit? I thought this was an optimistic gathering. <laughs> what's, what's specifically about Brexit? 
Brexit maybe some investition in uh, technology or uh, some support from uh, uh, European Union to... So, for me, one of the saddest aspects of um, what Britain is going through is um, innovation happens when you open the doors to bring different types of people together. I talked about cognitive diversity. And um, in the last decade, London has become a brilliantly energetic entrepreneurial ecosystem because in a street in Shoreditch in East London, you will have entrepreneurs who have come from Slovakia and Lithuania and Tel Aviv and India. And because they're all coming in with different viewpoints, you create the perfect conditions for people to solve problems in fresh ways. And when you start closing the doors, when you start thinking, you know, Britain should be one type of person, um, that talent goes somewhere else. And I think if there's one thing I've learned, the tech is universal. Anybody, anywhere can play with virtual reality, can play with data analytics. The real battle is for the smart people who can execute, who can get things done. And if you make it harder for those people to come to Košice, to um, anywhere where you want to build an ecosystem, they will go somewhere else. And at the moment, quite a lot of people are going to Lisbon. Quite a lot of people are going to Berlin, Paris. That's how you create economic value. Yeah, everything is about politics, but technology is uh, connect people and nations. It, it comes down to talent. How, if you are running a big company here, do you make it the place that the good people choose to work? Because a lot of people are not motivated by salary. They want to work, like in Supercell, with amazing people and feel they have a purpose in their work. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.